Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Archaeologists in Quarantine. Today I am joined by special guests, Berserker, Laura and Euros. Apologies for any mispronunciations, my viewers at home will know I'm terrible, so I do apologise. Um, straight in, um, could you please get a quick introduction into all of you? Maybe Berserker, if you can go first. Ooh. Audio. Sorry, one second. We can't hear you, Berserker. Can you try again? Okay. Yes. Can oh, you hear me perfect. Now? Yeah, yes. that's great. Okay, I can go closer. So my name is Berserka Gridarska. I'm Bulgarian-born, a prehistorian, a European prehistorian, and I live and work in the UK. Maybe Laura. Yeah, I can go next. Hello, everybody. My name is Laura Koltofian. Um, I'm um, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Archaeology and Gender in Europe Community of the European Association of Archaeologists. And I'm also a postdoctoral researcher, mostly working on the history of archaeology. But I'm also working on topics such as harassment, assault, bullying, and intimidation in archaeology. Now, gender stereotypes in archaeology and the history of women's engagement with archaeology. And Hello everyone, my name is Uros Matic, I'm Serbian-born Egyptologist and I currently have a postdoc position at the Austrian Archaeological Institute of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and among else I also deal with topics within gender archaeology, especially gender and violence and I have been the member of the previously mentioned Community Archaeology and Gender in Europe of the European Association of Archaeologists, more or less since its founding. And for a few years, I was also one of the co-chairs. That's brilliant. To be honest, I never even knew about these organizations, which is actually why I found it so surprising when um, I received your email, because why have I not heard of this? It's so important and we need it, yet, it just goes to show that there's so much that we can do, which is why I'm so excited to receive news about your Kickstarter. So I think first and foremost, what is AGE? When was it formed and what is its aims? Well, AGE, as Urush alluded to, is uh, Archaeology and Gender in Europe. And this is the abbreviation AGE. And this is a community within the European Association of Archaeologists. So the European Association of Archaeologists is a non-profit professional organization and which has members not only from uh, Europe, but also from globally, mainly from the United States. The European Association of Archaeologists was founded in 1994. And in the beginning, there were not so many members, but as the organization grew, it became apparent that various groups within that organization have similar interests and these interests slowly became to be formalized in what initially was called working parties but then now they are currently called communities so there are at least 20 communities within the EAA and one of these communities is our community age community uh, it was created uh, about 12, 12 years ago and when uh, when it says created, it's really like-minded people coming together and really like now chatting about things or uh, sharing information and concerns about what we are really interested in. But as I said, it, it can, became formalized in, uh, in, within the uh, auspice, within, within the Aegis of uh, EAA. And the major aim of our uh, of age is of course to promote gender and feminist uh, uh, topics and issues not only in the past but also in the current profession uh, various issues which we know that in the broader society concern gender are also very much valid for our profession and these are the kind of forums in which we can discuss those things uh, we have uh, formal um, uh, aims that can be seen on our website. So we have a website and Lara will tell us a little bit more who can be a member of that. But uh, basically it's an open-ended, it's a, a very bottom-up, uh, sorry, 
bottom up uh, grassroots uh, society um, community rather and we are open for everybody and uh, yes i probably see better <laughs> stop here brilliant thank you and laura if you could continue what um are the members of age and how and where do age members meet and how can interested people join yes well age currently has approximately 130 members from all around the world but mostly from europe and um, our members are usually archaeologists but also museum and heritage professionals who work on various aspects regarding gender and diversity in the past and in contemporary uh, disciplinary practice. And as AIDS members, we meet yearly at the annual meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists, uh, where we organize uh, sessions and also hold our annual community meeting. And um, in addition, throughout the year, we regularly keep in touch uh, via emails. And there were also occasions when the members organized workshops outside the um, uh, meetings of the European Association of Archaeologists. So, for example, we had workshops in Lisbon in 2017 or in Barcelona in 2010. And besides these sessions and uh, workshops that we regularly organize, uh, age members are also engaged in publishing their research as well as in organizing exhibitions and uh, various outreach activities. And what's important to say is that uh, even if age is a community of the European Association of Archaeologists, we also have members who are not EAA members. So we want age to grow, to be as um, diverse as possible, and um, basically we welcome anybody working on or um, interested in gender in archaeology to join us. There is no age membership fee, which makes things very easy. <laughs> And uh, those interested in joining us can do so simply by emailing the three cultures of age represented here by Bisseca and me, and by Ana Cristina Martins from Portugal. So if you would like to join us, just email us and we will send you a membership request form. And that's basically all. So you're all welcome to join us. And one question, sorry, you may have already asked this. Um, do you have to be a member of the EAA? No. 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 Okay. Okay. So uh, we have many members who are non EAA members. Yeah. Basically, everybody's welcome to join. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, and for our viewers at home, EAA is the Europe European Archaeological Association. Association of Archaeologists. Association of Archaeologists. <laughs> oh, Association of Archaeologists. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can see I'm not a member. <laughs> Brilliant. And. Um, in regards to current age specific editorial projects, we know that there's a booklet and uh, there's some themes. Maybe Juras, you could tell us a little bit more. Exactly. So um, as um, we already mentioned, uh, age is organizing sessions annually at uh, EAA meetings. But as Laura also said, we are working on other projects and in the second half of this conversation, we are going to devote more attention to our current uh, Kickstarter booklet project on gender stereotypes. But I would also like to mention one more project and um, this is uh, an edited volume dealing with uh, gender troubles, so to say, in uh, current archaeological debates. And uh, we are working with the series Teams in Contemporary Archaeology, uh, one of the EAA uh, or European Association of Archaeologists monograph series published by Springer. And uh, this book uh, has the aim uh, to work on the topics such as gender um, by analyzing how and why gender is missing in current archaeological debates, such as, for example, the so-called third science revolution, or uh, the topic of ontological turn, or the topic of violence in the past, or the topics of mobility or intersectionality, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is going to be an um, effort which is international and uh, it's going to include scholars in various phases of their career from junior postdoc, uh, 
uh, to already established, let's say, senior scholars or even pioneers in gender archaeology. So this is shortly about uh, this other project we are working on. Our other age members are also working on uh, publishing or preparing for publishing various other uh, team volumes, but um, we are not going to focus on these today. So these are just two examples uh, I wanted to mention. Mm. You know, just even as an introduction, it just shows how important this is and it's it's a shame that even now in 2021 that it's not spoken about as much as it should be i'm glad that we're having this conversation and i hope we can actually see a direct change and that's the the key part because it takes more you know it's so many of us that need to contribute to it in, in a sense to help change the narrative so i hope i hope we can achieve that um so in regards to the presentation of the booklet. I think we're going to look at um, gender stereotypes in archaeology and the Kickstarter campaign. So for all of those who do not know, Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform where you can donate anything from $1 to, I don't even know what the limit is, hundreds, thousands of dollars you can donate to a project that you find worthwhile. And I do have the link of that in the description below. So please check that out. And if you can't donate, it's okay. Sharing their project aims and even joining the society, that in itself is contributing to what we're trying to achieve, what they're trying to achieve. So Eurus, how the idea of the booklet was born, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that and how it's structured. Because it's quite interesting. It's quite difficult to comprise everything down into a nice bite size booklet. So what's the process behind that? Well, first of all, thank you for introducing the booklet and the Kickstarter initiative and uh, also asking our viewers to contribute even by sharing. And this is the most important aspect of this project, and that is solidarity. The question, how did we came to this idea? is actually related to my observation of what was going on at a European Association of Archaeologists meeting in the last few years. And I've noticed that, uh, well, although gender archaeology as it exists for like 50 years, more or less as a defined sub-discipline or a focus of the archaeological discipline, as we all know, it started more or less with uh, first uh, feminist analysis of androcentrism in archaeology in the 70s. However, I noticed that even 50 years later, we are still struggling with some of the topics this early uh, pioneers in feminist and gender archaeology struggled. And the idea that we are now past androcentrism or that we are past, uh, let's say, heteronormativity in approaches to the past, or that we are done with gender archaeology, that we are in post-gender uh, state of archaeology, um, this is simply false. And uh, the actually archaeological practice shows that there is still much to be done and that uh, some very simple stereotypes which one can find outside archaeology about the past or the present uh, is are found also in in, in archaeology and this is what uh, we were surprised of uh, we were thinking that maybe things change but this is a contextual question you know it's it's different saying that something changed let's say um, in the states or in the uk uh, or in norway scandinavian countries where, where gender archaeology and feminist archaeology originated maybe some things change there but um, the state of gender archaeology or gender within archaeology in some other countries is definitely not the same so we should uh, not uh, live in this bubble or illusion that that uh, that gen gender archaeology is mainstream, and um, this is how uh, we came uh, with the idea to uh, battle this by uh, producing a booklet uh, which is going to address these issues in a very straightforward and direct way, and that is how. 
uh, we imagine this booklet as a sort of a catalog of stereotypical images about the past and present uh, concerning gender. And uh, as we will discuss later, some of these images are like very direct stereotypes. For example, that all uh, female uh, figurines in the past are mother goddesses and nothing else. Uh, but other stereotypical images, which are not so easy to uh, reproduce uh, visually, um, one of them is, for example, the idea that there is no harassment on gender or sexual basis in archaeology. So we wanted to include in this booklet these various stereotypes and to present them with a, with a very clear and direct image. And uh, these images were produced by a Serbian uh, graphic artist, uh, Nikola Radosavljevic. Uh, and um, the, uh, he produced these images in cooperation with our contributors for the booklet and us as editors. Uh, so every single image uh, depicts one stereotype and is followed by a short text of 250 words, which actually uh, deconstructs uh, this uh, stereotypical image by stating what is wrong with this picture, how did this stereotype came to be, uh, and how we can... Um, work together to uh, change this or what would be the more accurate image based on uh, current archaeological knowledge. So this would be my short introduction into how this booklet came to be and uh, uh, Bisek and Laura are going to tell you more about the content and the functioning of our Kickstarter campaign. Brilliant. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, two broad themes to which um, Urush already alluded. So, we, broad, broad themes within which we have several entries, as we call them, seven these short descriptions, sh short texts. So, one uh, big theme is about interpretations of the past for which we have very little or no evidence to be interpreted as they are. And these are reproduced and reproduced and reproduced with very little content or very little really evidence to suggest that this was indeed, this is how it was in the past. For example, that only males were violent in the past. This is a very much a kind of a current perception and therefore why not it's exactly the same in the past. So this is a a huge array of uncritical impositions of present views of what we, we consider to be a present reality, which is uncritically um, uh, sort of put like a mold on the past. So this is, we have um, uh, probably the majority of our uh, entries is about, it's about uh, that kind of uh, wrong perceptions. A very important second theme is about the current myths about our discipline, and which are again very difficult to fight and to battle. And one of these myths, for example, is that male and female archaeologists have equal opportunities, equal career opportunities. Perhaps in some uh, corners of Europe, like mainly in Scandinavia, that equality has been achieved. And, but whether it has been achieved in equal pay, again, this is probably still debatable. But yes, we do know that in certain corners of Europe, uh, it is difficult to argue that um, male and female archaeologists don't have um, equal opportunities, but majority, the majority across the world don't enjoy equal uh, career opportunities. And this is just the one. Uh, we have other similar um, um, stereotypes which we, we want to, 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 to present, to battle, to fight. Uh, so these are the, the, the two major themes. Uh, we started with a list of 20 entries, but then it was very interesting how when we suggested this to our age uh, community, said, well, this is our idea, this is what to do, this is uh, our initial 
a list of um, themes that we want to discuss, what would you say? And it is very interesting how people started to come back with either refinement of what we need to say or, or completely new suggestions, which is suggests that it's, that it's a very dynamic process. It's not, oh no, now you're right about that. It is really a very uh, much like a dialogue. And this is because we are a network of like-minded people, ages like that. So therefore there was uh, a, a nice, co co we complementing each other with interesting, with what we were suggesting, what was our idea and what later uh, came from our members. So currently we have 25 uh, entries, no, 24, 25 years still, sort of finalizing the, uh, the list of entries. Uh, our authors are primarily, almost almost 90% uh, are age members, but we also have non-age members who are contributing to as authors. Unfortunately, mostly female, <laughs> only three authors we have male, which is again, that is another, we're fighting that uh, idea that gender should be also only done by women and it's only about women it is not and this is one of the things so but yes we have only three males but there we go we do have male authors and they uh, are authors uh, again from across Europe uh, not only uh, uh, British academics, but we have um, also from um, USA. And we're also very proud that we have authors which are, we have the whole range of, of authors from professors, very esteemed professors, to scholars, young scholars who just finished their PhDs. And I think that again shows that the gender is very much alive across the spectrum from, uh, it's not uh, an intellectual pursuit of kind of, of elite, somewhere in the uh, Anglo-speaking world, but it is really uh, a much broader um, research topic, uh, which we, we are very happy to, uh, that it, it, it turned out to be like that. And probably Laura now needs to say something about the, the campaign, because obviously the, it's also very good to have good ideas, but somebody has to pay for them. So <laughs> that's how we came for that. <laughs> yeah, so Laura, please, if you could um, tell us a little bit more about the Kickstarter campaign. Well, we are very excited about it. Uh, so in order to raise the necessary funds for the publication of the book, we launched a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. Kickstarter being one of the most popular crowdfunding platforms out there. And our minimum funding goal was of uh, 5,300 euros, which is quite a, mon a lot of money, uh, at least for us. And we knew that it would have been very difficult to raise this amount of money through, tradi through um, traditional funding lines, mm. such as grants, for example. Um, and we also wanted to publish the book quite fast. So um, applying for grants would have been a long and slow process. So we basically took the challenge and built a Kickstarter campaign, which if successful would have allowed us to raise the minimum funding goal or even more in just 30 days. And uh, it was the first time that we were doing a crowdfunding campaign. So we had to learn to do it from scratch, but it was really fun to do it. And having no experience with crowdfunding campaigns, uh, we were a bit worried at the beginning because for example, we thought that we won't reach our funding goal. And for example, I remember that I was looking at various projects on Kickstarter and there were several which were uh, more than 1000% funded uh, funded in just a few days and that seemed so far for me <laughs> and uh, moreover projects on Kickstarter also work on an um, all or nothing uh, principle so in case we didn't fully reach our goal all the money would have been lost so all this was a bit intimidating but it really determined us to be willing to succeed so we invested a lot of time in writing the project and reading the best practice recommendation on Kickstarter in setting up the rewards packages uh, for our backers, in the careful calculations of the budget that we needed, and in which we also had to include tiny details such as shipment fees and all sorts of taxes. So we really had to pay attention to many, many things that um, sometimes we didn't, don't even think about. And we even designed the fabric bags and the postcards and the stickers that we included in the reward packages and uh, it was really fun and we've learned a lot. So we launched our Kickstarter campaign for 30 days and to our surprise, we managed to reach uh, the minimum funding goal in just six days, 
which is really amazing for an archaeology related project. And it was incredible to see that we made it. And we were even more surprised to see that uh, even if we reached this minimum funding goal, um, backings continued um, uh, coming. And of course, all this wouldn't have been possible without our uh, backers. And we are grateful, uh, extremely grateful to all of them. And um, reaching out to them meant that we had to invest a lot of time in uh, dissemination, which we basically carried out on social media platforms and emails. And an important part of our dissemination process was to contact our colleagues, as well as archaeological organizations, magazines, and archaeologists with strong presence in social media, such as you are, Natasha, in order to help us further disseminate um, the campaign. So currently, I mean, today, we have three more days left until our campaign closes, and we can still receive backings. So if you would like to support us, you can still do it by the 13th of January. And all the new backings will be invested for printing additional booklets that will be freely distributed around the world, as well as for a more elaborate and colored face design. So if you would like to support us, you can find the link to our Kickstarter campaign in the description of this video. And what's important to mention is that the uh, booklet will be published open access so basically part of the funds raised through the Kickstarter campaign will go in making this booklet um, available, freely available to you, everybody upon publication. And for this, we of course have to thank uh, South Tidestone Press, who is our generous publisher. It's brilliant. And it, it's so important to even try to make this accessible to everybody and by making it free, you're, you're, you know, you're doing that. So that in yes. itself is, is really great news. And in a way, you know, it's such a shame that we have to crowdfund for this. You know, that you have to ask for funding. Luckily, you did it in under a week, which is fantastic, especially for an archaeology related project. I mean, that is amazing. I think it just goes to show how important this is and how it, there's a gap that needs to be filled. And hopefully this will enable a conversation to start. Now, for our viewers at home, don't forget, you can write your questions in for our speakers just in the YouTube chat box. So if you're on Instagram, head over to YouTube and then I'll be able to see your comments. And, you know, something as Archeo Duck mentions, I think it was when Euros was speaking, um, it's so true. She thinks it's true. Um, we tend to focus on the cutting edge in a particular sub-discipline and forget that the majority of practitioners are still adhering to the previous viewpoint. Exactly. It's just... Yeah you know, a lot of things. And I feel like it's so, I mean, gender and archeology span that in itself, as we've already mentioned, is, is two parts. One is as an archeologist in the career as a discipline, as well as then the practice of archeology span itself, even how we interpret archeological deposits, all of this is factored in and gender is quite a key part of it, but it's not something we maybe pay too much attention to, which again, hopefully, conversations like this will maybe start to change. Mm. So we're coming up to the third part of today's live stream, which is the part that I think most people are excited to um, actually hear. And that is some examples of stereotypes that we do see in gender archeology. span um, And I've given the option to share screen. So hopefully in case you need to, you should be able to do that. Um, Thank you. So if it's possible, we could have some examples, please. Of course. So, um, Biseka, would you like to start or should yes, I? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> uh, well, we uh, we have multiple issues that we want to address. As I mentioned, we we have twenty five entries, so we want we have multiple issues that we'd like to address. But if there is one overarching goal with this uh, with this book that we want to achieve, is really to invite colleagues to think about the past in less um, essentialist terms, or in other words, not to think that there is one, only one right interpretation of the past that we can, and, and which is mainly informed from, by the present. And then we can take that one right interpretation of the past and put it around. And then like, uh, as I said, like a mold to all of the past society. So, Having said that then, 
we are faced with a very big challenge of one of our entries, which we, we are called, which is called, is gender universal. And if you, if you start thinking about it, the word gender is a, it's, first of all, it's an English word and it, it's present uh, connotation in the, in, in the meaning that we are using it at this very moment. It actually uh, uh, is a recent arrival. It's about in the 50s, in the 60s, it started to be used in the, in the sense that we are using in this particular, in this particular uh, uh, live stream. We know that the non-Indo-European uh, languages, for example, are not gendered. That is to say that they don't have a concept from she, he and it. So this is one set of languages that don't have such a concept. There are other languages within the Indo-European group that do not have the word gender in them. So then you will say, how is it then possible? How we then, if we want to have a more diverse um, understanding of the past, it seems as if we want to impose to that past a single concept of gender. And we certainly don't want to do that. We most certainly we don't want to do. We are trying to say that with or without word for gender, with or without a concept for she, he, it. There were, there were gender roles, what we now call gender roles, what we now say uh, gender expectations and identities, which were pertain to different kinds of people. The people were not man and woman, male and female, and they had exactly uh, very strictly assigned roles. They're much more complex, much more diverse, and this is what we want to tackle. There is not an easy way to that. We have to obviously look at our concrete evidence and start to disentangle uh, uh, the various, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, strings that we have. But uh, this is one of my, our, most, our most complex uh, uh, um, uh, stereotypes that we want to deconstruct. I promise you, all the others are not so complex, but I, just to give you the sense that some of them are really very complex and we are not we are admitting that we understand that some of them are very complex and we are trying to explain this in 250 words, which is very, very, very difficult. So the others to which uh, Laura and Urush will say they're hopefully simpler, <laughs> that will be easier for our audience to, to engage with. So should I go first or Urush? Yeah, yeah, I would suggest Laura continues with the second <laughs> okay. example because the one I'm going to represent <laughs> is also a bit complex. So um, I okay. think maybe it's better for you, Laura, for you to present the second yeah. one. Okay, no worries. So um, another stereotype that you will be uh, dealing with in the booklet is that um, mm. archaeology is free of harassment and assault, especially sexual. And in reality, recent surveys have shown that archaeology actually suffers from a culture of harassment, assault, bullying, and um, intimidation. So some of these surveys also reveal, reveal that harassment in archaeology comes under various forms, from sexual power and psychological to gender and religious, among others. And the problem is that very often these offensive behaviors become normalized and um, are not recognized anymore. So we consider that it's very important to include in the booklet uh, an entry on harassment, assault, intimidation, and bullying um, as a way of raising awareness among the practitioners of archeology span and also the fans of archeology. span um, because awareness of the existence of these misconducts is one of the first steps towards preventing and combating them. And um, we have to raise awareness of the fact that these behaviors can happen in various settings, from fieldwork, university, to um, museums and scientific events, and anybody can be a victim and anybody can be a perpetrator. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that these offensive behaviors can generate all sorts of um, emotional and psychological wounds and traumas. They can lead to insecurity, anxiety, and even depression. 
And there are even examples of victims who renounce their jobs um, um, or who abandon the archaeology forever, while their perpetrators continue living, researching, and pressing undisturbed. So it's our com common responsibility to raise awareness of these misconducts. And the booklet, uh, and including this topic in the booklet, is one of the ways to do it. Well, uh, I would first like to say thank you for uh, these two uh, previously mentioned stereotypes. And uh, it is also important to, to uh, mention and explain to the audience watching us that there, are, there is a wide range of stereotypes uh, we are including in this booklet. For example, one of the most uh, commonly found stereotypes about gender archaeology as a praxis is that it's... Uh, done only by women, for example, or that uh, uh, straight uh, cis men uh, cannot do gender archaeology. And this is simply a false assumption. Um, and why is this so? Because even if an author, uh, no matter male or female, uh, is not aware of um, gender archaeology and gender theory, writing about the past, this person is inevitably writing about men, women, children, others in a very specific way. What differs is that gender archaeologists are very much aware of the problems of often made assumptions which are not based on the evidence. However, this attempt gender archaeology is making is very often labeled as gender uh, uh, ideology. So to say one of the most common found stereotypes is that gender as studied by gender archeologists is an ideology. And what is meant with this is that uh, those who accuse gender archeology span of being an ideology often also call this kind of a construct of the gender feminist or gay lobby or gender mainstreaming. So there is this idea of some kind of a dark force which lurks behind and which in, in the terms of this global far right movement ideas and concepts wants to endanger family, moral, or even the nation. So there is this far right resistance to equality which is propagated by feminism and justified through very superficial political, cultural, or religious explanations. And the problem with these stereotypes is also that it is uh, based on a very, uh, let's say, simplified understanding of the word ideology. And that in this classical Marxist definition of ideology as a promotion of false ideas about uh, the political regimes to subjects under their control in order to reproduce the status quo. So to say there is some kind of a, a natural state or a God-given state which this gender ideology and propaganda wants to destroy and to put something on top of it. However, if we look at uh, ideology in a different way, let's say how Slavoj Žižek understands ideology, um, maybe ideology is exactly the idea that there is some kind of a, a pre-signified nature when society is concerned, where everything is natural or God-given and um, it functions in the same way everywhere. So um, gender archaeology is one of the archaeological practices which is very well aware of the historicity of concepts such as sex, gender, and sexuality, of diversity of this concept, not only today, but also in the past. And how to communicate this with an image? I'm now going to share for our audience one of the images we are including uh, in our uh, booklet. Um, just trying to find this option, share screen. And I hope that you can see it here. So uh, this is the illustration which is going to follow the entry uh, on the stereotype that uh, gender as practiced in archaeology is an ideology, uh, in archaeology is an ideology. And on first glance, uh, this picture has nothing to do with archaeology. 
But uh, if you look at it more carefully, you will see this uh, giant woman equipped with a book and knowledge going in a very normal, so to say, uh, step through a city. And the two, uh, not accidentally here depicted white men, are running away screaming. And one of them is imagining uh, a boss who is female, but also not a white woman, or uh, a boss who is female, but also not a white uh, woman, uh, getting a paycheck which is equal paycheck as he got it. So uh, we wanted to kind of uh, make a caricature of this idea that what gender archaeology stands for is ideology, uh, as understood by, let's say, far-right movement. So um, looking at this picture, what the observer should uh, learn is that having a female boss uh, is not necessarily scary or scarier than having a male boss or that having a female boss who is not a white woman is not necessarily scary or any more scarier than having a, a boss who is a white uh, man. And of course, through this, we wanted to um, include the current issues on uh, race as understood in the States, not in Europe. There is a difference there. Uh, and the uh, Black uh, Lives Matter movement, uh, because as we already spoke about this, this whole project is based on solidarity and gender is part of intersectional um, aspects of identity. So we cannot forget this. And this is also what we want to communicate through this image, uh, as I just explained. Wow. <laughs> where to begin, where to end? You know, it's just, it makes me upset that we have to have these conversations in 2021. However, I'm glad that we are having them, <laughs> you know? Um, it's, it's very powerful when you see an image because it, it speaks a thousand words. And to the viewer, it's interesting how we may interpret it. Everyone interprets as something slightly different. So it's, it'd be nice to see an image in contrast with, you know, 250 words. Even though I can't believe you're writing something in 250 words. <laughs> like uh, it's really amazing. Well, we think, we think it's important to do it in this uh, manner because, um, the problem we were facing is that gender stereotypes are often fought within academia itself in, in academic writing, which reaches a very limited audience. However, if you imagine a booklet which is focused on images and short texts, very direct, very specific, distributed for free all over the world to universities, institutes, university libraries, museum shops, then these ideas are reaching a broader audience. And in this way, we are trying to make people think and ask themselves, uh, is the way I see this informed? Is the way I see this um, correctly informed? Is the way I see this the only way? Are there possible ways in which uh, possible ways could this be? Mm. And I, I wanted to add that uh, each entry is followed by two references where readers can uh, find more information about the stereotype that an entry is deconstructing. So we also try to do this. I mean, the, the entries are short, but if you want to find more, to read more, you have this reference list. It was very difficult to select this bibliography because there's quite a lot, but um, you have this like, select the bibliography and you can go and find out more. Mm -hmm. So for example, from our examples today, we saw about the use of language with gender. So she, he, it's interesting actually with some languages we have masculine and feminine words, don't we? In English we don't, but I know when I was studying French that we do. So it's interesting even that, how that's constructed, how the challenges that are around just the language, the use of language. And I've seen, I've seen it now, we're, we're trying to, there's people who are trying to address that. 
it's very difficult though I must admit like uh, language it's a very difficult thing to change we are not and in the business of making easy <laughs> conclusions not in the business of easy stuff. So yes. this this is a quite a challenge but you know this is because as we said several times uh we are not the first to try to uh um to to to, to make sense of gender in the past. Uh, we have really feminist thinkers who have done move mountains uh, into, of, in academic terms. And yet when it comes to, um, to what we to if you go to a regular conference, probably 2% of what you will hear has some kind of engagement with gendered past massively it will be about pots nothing wrong with the pots i love pots or, or with some kind of uh, um, landscape again love landscapes but we, we should not uh, divide our interpretation of the past like that we need always to think that in the end past is about people and these people were never just the one man just the one woman or this is much more diverse much more diverse and and we have to strive to understand that. I'm not saying it's easy, because that's where we started. There is no easy way, but we have to try it. And that's why we try this more simpler way of presenting, uh, sort of very, uh, we hope it's a very clear image and a very impact, uh, impactful image with a short text saying, well, please colleagues, think about it. Just please think about it next time when you're faced with your evidence. Do not reach out for the easy shortcuts and saying, ah, well, that's what it is. Just just spend a little bit more time and think whether maybe, maybe, maybe there is a different story to tell. And this image is another example. Is this looking at uh, more? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I will just give a short, short background. So mm. uh, if, if you look at this image, you're going to see three uh, male white archaeologist excavating, uh, excavating a, a grave. And then you're going to see that uh, they're imagining uh, the past based on um, the archaeological record. And what we wanted to communicate with this image is that we tend to think about the past very often in our own terms, as we already uh, stressed. And the way we wanted to communicate this is that if you look carefully, the way uh, the archaeologists in this image are dressed is the same way, more or less, at least when the patterns of their dress is concerned, uh, as the imagined men in the past are dressed. For example, the one with the stripes, imagines the one with the stripes in the past and the one the one with the and polka dots is imagining the other one with the polka dots in the past. And of course, we know that uh, it's problematic to suggest that there were some kind of uh, uh, patterns like this, but this is not the point of, of this image. The point is we want to communicate that they're imagining kind of men as they are in present being like that in the past. And they are fighting dangerous animals. They are hunting, they are doing all of these activities Whereas in the in the background, or as we have it here, there is a woman who is silently foraging. And what we wanted to, to show with this image is the stereotype that archaeologists very often, although it has been written so much about this, tend to value hunt more than any other activities, uh, or that hunt has to be something done only by men, although we simply do not or very often lack the evidence suggesting that only men were hunting or that uh, only uh, women were foraging. And we are all, always thinking about very specific men and women, you know, so you have to think about also elderly men, elderly women, girls, boys, dis um, people with disabilities, and so on and so forth. So the image of the past is complex and we should be uh, aware of the dangers of making this past simplified through words and images, also in academic writing. So this is the, the point of, of this image and the stereotype it wants to deconstruct. Now this is very interesting, to be honest. It, it does make one think actually when we're excavating something, what are we, the archeologists thinking as we're doing that? It's uh, very thought-provoking. Um, 
good. That's what that's that's the aim. <laughs> this that's, is what we that's, want. That's it. Yeah. Yay! Yeah, yeah it is. Great. I think there's so many there's so many things I think we as individuals must look at first as well within ourselves as um Itzel Buddha has also mentioned you know um you know they said becoming aware of one's bias is the beginning one must constantly reevaluate one's view and I think that pretty much sums up the message that you're all trying to say today we need to start with ourselves and only then hopefully and look at how other people interpret something and how they address that information, how they portray that information. Um, yeah, brilliant. I'm very excited to see the uh, book. When is it due for publication or print? Any idea? Ooh. Well, uh, actually we, we're aiming to finish it by uh, the EAA in uh, Kiel, which is at the beginning of September, 2021 but it depends on a lot of factors on the pandemic. So the aim is this, if everything goes well, uh, also with Sidestone Press, but um, our like uh, ultimate <laughs> deadline is uh, the end of November. Yes. Okay. And this image. <laughs> yes, so I... I... <laughs> I you couldn't resist. To, yeah, I couldn't resist. <laughs> and I also wanted to, uh, because the first st stereotypes uh, we were discussing uh, are, of course, archaeology related, but uh, we wanted uh, to show some examples which are like really uh, basic archaeology related, so to say, not only these meta theoretical questions about is gender archaeology and ideology and so on and so forth. So the last example I was showing uh, with this uh, male excavators and the way they imagined the past was one of these uh, like very basic problems we face in archaeology. And this is another one. So the stereotype this image is supposed to communicate is that uh, same-sex uh, acts or intercourse or relations uh, are a modern invention, also some kind of a modern ideology. And we know that this is simply not true, that uh, same-sex intercourse existed also in past societies and that it was uh, differently structured than in our society, uh, which of course does not mean that it was some kind of a um, completely a liberal world uh, devoid of any kind of uh, judgment or oppression. Of course, we're not saying that. And we are, are very well aware of the fact that uh, some uh, forms of identity were not welcomed also in past uh, society or simply did not exist, or that some practices were also maybe not welcomed in some societies or did not exist in some societies, but yet they, they existed in others and were variously tolerated. So we wanted to ask the question, why are we keeping eyes closed on these matters or why are we keeping eyes of the others closed on these matters like for example this father figure and the boy uh, visiting a museum and seeing let's say an ancient greek depiction of uh, male lovers or men engaged in any sort of uh, sexual uh, activities so um this is one of the stereotypes we also want to tackle. And it actually, I think, answers Archaeoduct's question, which was um, the focus, is there a focus more on gender archaeology or more on sexism? Because gender is socially constructed and is not always binary, whereas the discussion here is mainly about sexism. So I would like to think that this somewhat answers that, that there is, there's more elements that are being addressed in the booklet. And and I do love act. this, I love this image. Uh, you can actually see the entire content of the booklet uh, on the, our Kickstarter page. Yeah. So there we listed all the um, uh, stereotypes that we are deconstructing. And I can't hear you, Bisepka. I will try again with the microphone. No. <laughs> so for our viewers at home, whilst we're just getting over this technical issue, if you have any questions, quickly type them in now as we're coming towards the end of the stream. 
No. Oh, so this is the image that we used during the advertisement for the live stream. Yes, and uh, I also wanted to use it to relate to the previous question. So it's not only about sexism, it's also about deconstructing uh, our expectations about uh, gender division of labor, for example, and the often made assumptions that only uh, um, men uh, were engaged, let's say, with uh, metallurgy, and that it is simply not possible for women to be engaged in uh, this process or any stages of this process, because we have to also think about chain operatoire. So it's a very complex matter. It can't be simplified and binarized like this. And uh, just, to, just to relate to this question from the audience, uh, we wanted also to communicate through this booklet is... Uh, even the understanding of gender archaeology is not one. So there are different archaeologists approach gender and understand gender in different way, just as different anthropologists or philosophers or psychoanalysts understand gender in different ways. So there is no single gender archaeology. There are gender archaeologies, which makes actually the field uh, very live. The debate is actual and... Um, it's constantly um, rethinking and uh, deconstructing its own prejudices or ideas based on new evidence, for example. There's so many things that I think we need to address. Even when you're going to the museum from the previous image, you know, you're going to the museum and what are we seeing? What's our natural filters and uh, social constructs that are put around us to to assume something as we interpret it. And again here, we can't say what gender somebody was for a job role. I don't think it's possible. And I think people look at more so the structure, don't they? They look at the skeletal form and they're like, oh, well, this person is strong, so they have to be able to do it. Cause you know, that's the, the problem with maybe toxic masculinity. Maybe that's actually what it is. Um, but that's just, it's just been so fascinating today, actually. and. I do hope that uh, it will help people maybe approach archaeology in, in a different way and history and to honest, any subject, any sphere, life in general, you know? <laughs> um, let's see, I'm just gonna check the chat box. Yeah, again, it's about, you know, gender roles, how people interpret gender roles. Yeah, exactly. Is there anything else that you all like to add whilst we? Oh, just a little bit. I think you might need to just do your wire a little bit. Very, 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 yeah. But I think Bisek, I wanted to thank all of our contributors <laughs> and uh, supporters, our funders, because without their support, this project would not be successful. So sorry, Bisek, I'm now stepping in and trying to uh, communicate your ideas. So thank to everyone who uh, not only donated, uh, thanks to everyone who, who shared uh, this initiative and uh, supported us in this way. It's Without brilliant. this solidarity uh, within the community and outside of it, this would not work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And if you do have any questions for our speakers, please put them in the comments. So it's a different part of the YouTube video. And we'll be sure, hopefully, to try to maybe address them in a future video or a future post. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Again, the Kickstarter link. Thank you very no, much. Thank you, Natasha. seriously. And thank you the, for the kick viewers. Yeah, thank you viewers. The Kickstarter link is in the description below. So don't forget just to check that out and share it. You know, you can tweet it, Facebook, Instagram. The world is your oyster. Okay, so thank you everybody. Have a lovely day, evening, night, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, bye.